Dirty Bertie, Bogies, David Roberts, written by Alan MacDonald, published by Stripes. Book One, Bogies. Chapter One. Bertie, Miss Boot thundered, are you paying attention? Bertie shot upright. Crack! Ow! He had forgotten he was looking for his rubber under his desk. He peeped out, rubbing his head. Sit down, barked Miss Boot. Now what was I just saying? When? asked Bertie. While you were crawling around under your desk. Bertie racked his brains, trying to remember. The truth was, he hadn't been following too closely. Whenever Miss Boot started talking, Bertie's mind had a habit of wandering off. Um... You were saying? Bertie looked to Eugene for help. Eugene mouthed something he didn't quite catch. You were saying about fried eggs? The class sniggered. <laughs> Eugene whispered in his ear. Oh, Friday. You were saying about Friday. Miss Boot folded her arms. Yes, and what's happening on Friday? Do tell us. Bertie hadn't the faintest clue. We're having a day off, he said, hopefully. More laughter. Ha, 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 ha. Thump. Miss Boots' fist slammed down on her desk. We are not having a day off. I was talking about our visitor. Can anyone tell Bertie who's coming to school on Friday? A sea of hands rose in the air. Miss Boots' eyes fell on the pale boy bouncing up and down in the front row like an eager puppy. <laughs> yes, Nicholas? The mayoress, said no all Nick. Quite right. I'm glad someone is paying attention, said Miss Boot. Nick smiled at Bertie, scowled back. Miss Boot went on. It's a great honor to have someone as important as the mayoress coming to our school. I'm sure you're all very excited. Oh, Bernie yawned. Why were school visitors always so boring? Why didn't they invite someone interesting for a change, like a lion tamer or a brain surgeon? No, said Miss Boot, eyeing the class. Miss Skinner would like one of our class to do a special job. One lucky child is going to welcome the Marys in assembly. Who wants to volunteer? The hands shut up again. Bertie couldn't see what all the fuss was about. No or Nick was jiggling around as if he needed the toilet. Oh, Miss, 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 me, me, he gasped. Miss Boot hesitated. Last time there was a visitor, she had chosen Nick to meet them. And the time before. Hands down, she said. Since so many of you are keen, we will all put your names in a hat and draw one out. Everyone wrote their name on a piece of paper and put it in a biscuit tin. Miss Boot didn't actually have a hat. Miss Boot drew out one scrap of paper and unfolded it. She read the name scrawled in big letters. She turned white. She looked as if it, she might pass out. Who? Who is it? Everyone asked. Bertie, groaned Miss Boot. Bertie looked up from doodling on his maths book. What? I wasn't doing anything, he said. Miss Boot sighed. If you were listening, Bertie, you'd know that you've just been chosen to welcome the mayoress. Me, said Bertie. Really? Really, Miss Boot. The bell went for break. She screwed up the piece of paper in her hand. She needed to find somewhere quiet to lay down. Chapter 2 You, said Dad. You, said Susie. They want you to meet the mayor. Actually, it's the mayor Hess, Bertie said. But why you? 
They had the whole school to choose from. Why didn't they pick someone with half a brain? Bertie ignored this remark. Miss Booth thought I'd be good at it. He said, meeting mayoresses and that, making speeches. Dad looked horrified. Surely they don't want you to make a speech. I don't know yet, said Bertie. We're having a practice on Thursday. Mum put an arm around his shoulder. Well, I think it's wonderful, Bertie, she said. I'm very proud of you. Yes, said Bertie, sticking out his tongue at his sister. He hadn't mentioned that he had been selected by pure chance. It was a small detail. Susie still couldn't believe it. Has your teacher got a screw loose? She asked. Does she know what you're like? I don't see why you're making such a fuss," said Bertie. "All I've got to do is give her a bunch of old flowers. It's not difficult." "Of course it's not," said Mum. "But it is the mayoress, and she is very important." "I've never heard of her," said Bertie. "And the whole school will be watching," Mum went on. Oh yes, I forgot," said Bertie. "Miss Boot says a man from the Pudsley Post is coming as well. The newspaper, yes, he is going to take my picture with the mayoress. Good heavens, is that a good idea?" asked Dad. Bernie frowned. He'd expected a bit more enthusiasm. He thought his family would be pleased that his picture was going to be in the paper. I'm sure it will be fine," said Mum. "Just as long as you don't do anything silly." "Like what?" asked Bertie. "Burping," said Susie. "Or talking with your mouth full," said Dad. "And please, 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 Bertie, don't pick your nose." Pleaded Mum, "I won't," said Bertie. "When do I pick my nose?" "Only every five minutes," said Susie scornfully. "Well, what does it matter? It's my nose," said Bertie. "It's not as if I go round picking any old nose." Mum rolled her eyes. "You just cannot do it. Not when you're meeting the mayoress." "I won't." Or the other thing," said Susie. "What other thing? You know, eating bogies," said Susie. "It's disgusting." "I don't." "You do." Dad held up a hand. "In any case, nose picking is a horrible habit. It's time you gave it up," he said. "I will," said Bertie. "But," "No buts," said Mum firmly. I want you to promise. Bertie sighed heavily. I promise, he said. You won't catch me picking my nose again. Chapter three. Bertie went upstairs to his room, humming to himself. He'd promised his parents they wouldn't catch him picking his nose, so he'd just have to make sure he wasn't caught. In any case, he didn't see what all the fuss was about. Everyone picked their noses. His friends certainly did. Bertie and Darren often compared bogies to see who had the biggest. They'd invented several bogey games, including bogey golf, bogey table football, and roller bogey. Grown-ups picked their noses too. Bertie had seen his dad do it when he was driving, and Miss Boot did it. When she was reading a book, he bet even the queen picked her nose when no one was looking. So what was the harm if Bertie sometimes had a good clean out? Talking of which, there was no one about now. Bertie, Mum stuck her head round the corner. Remember what you promised. I wasn't, cried Bertie. I just had an itch. Mum tutted. "I'm watching you." 
Bertie flopped down on his bed. This was terrible. If you couldn't pick your nose in your own bedroom, where could you do it? Five minutes later, he slipped out of the back door. His top secret hideout was behind the garden. Darren and Eugene were the only ones who knew about it and they were sworn to secrecy. Bertie pushed his way in among the bushes and sat down, alone at last. Now for Bertie, what are you doing? Dad was staring at him through the shed window. Nothing, said Bertie. I was just looking for Whiffler. He's asleep on the sofa. Come out of there. It's filthy. Bertie trooped back to the house. This was hopeless. His parents wouldn't leave him alone for five minutes. He was actually glad when it was time to go to bed. Mum came in to tuck him in. Good night, Bertie. Night, Mum. Sleep tight. Click. Off went the bedroom light. Peace and quiet at last. No one to disturb him. Bliss. Bertie's finger crept out from under the covers. Bertie, called Mum. Stop picking your nose. Chapter 4 For the rest of the week, Bertie's parents watched him like vultures. He couldn't even lift a hand without Bertie tutting or Dad glaring at him. He tried to find places where he could be by himself. On Tuesday, Mum found him hiding in the towel cupboard. On Wednesday, Dad caught him in Whiffler's kennel. School was just as bad. Miss Boot made him practice his part for assembly over and over again. She barked orders at him. Don't slouch, hands out, or if your pockets, stop mumbling, speak up. By the time Friday came round, Bertie was beginning to wish he'd never been chosen. He wished he was sitting with his friends instead of standing at the front with a bunch of droopy flowers. He could see Darren and Eugene pulling faces at him. Darren put two fingers up his nose as a joke. The man from the Pudley Post was ready with his camera. Bertie shuffled his feet nervously. What if he did something wrong? What if he tripped on the steps or trod on the flowers? What if he forgot what to say? The hall was hot and airless. Miss Boot was frowning at him. More than anything, Bertie was trying to pick his nose. He always picked his nose when he was nervous. And now it was like having a terrible itch which you couldn't scratch. His nose felt bunged up. He was convinced he had a giant bogey poking out of his nostril. But he didn't dare investigate, not with the whole school watching. A door opened and Miss Skinner entered, followed by the mayoress. Bertie had been expecting someone royal, like the Queen. But the mayoress could have been one of his grand's best friends. She wore a plum-coloured dress which matched her face. Round her neck, was a large silver chain. She took a seat while Miss Skinner turned to face the rows of children. We are extremely honoured, blah, 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 droned Miss Skinner. Bertie had stopped listening. he just noticed no one in the hall was looking at him. They were all gazing up at the mayoress and her silver chain. Go on, said a voice in Bertie's head. One little pick. What harm can it do? Bertie bent his head as if he needed to scratch his nose. It didn't take more than a few seconds. Bertie, his Miss Boot, hurry up. We're waiting. 
Bertie dropped his hand. Had he been spotted? He glanced around. No, but Miss Skinner had stopped talking. Everybody was waiting for him to welcome the visitor. He thudded up the steps and onto the stage. He thrust the droopy flowers at the mayoress. For you, Miss Mayoress, from all the children, he gabbled in one breath. Oh, thank you. How kind, smiled the mayoress. Bertie turned away. Everything might have been all right if he'd gone back to his place there and then. But he realized he'd forgotten something. He was meant to shake hands. He turned back and stuck out one sweaty hand. Bertie stared in horror. There was something stuck to the end of his finger. A giant green bogey. The mayoress had seen it too. She bent closer to examine it. Oh, what is that? What? asked Bertie. That thing stuck to your finger. Oh, er, uh, said Bertie. It's, um, uh. And then he did it. The thing he claimed he never did. The thing that no one in the school who saw it happen would ever forget. The thing you must never do when someone is about to take your picture for the paper. Book two, Potty, chapter one. Bagsy, sit at that back. Bertie clattered up the steps onto the coach. It was the day of the school trip. Bertie loved going on trips. He loved the coach ride there, the packed lunches and pulling faces at passing cars. He loved drawing on the windows, stuffing crisps and fizzy drinks and being sick on the way home. Best of all, a trip meant a whole day without boring lessons. No moldy maths or dreary spelling. No hours of listening to Miss Boot droning on and on. Today, the class was going to Rust Bottom Hall. Miss Boot said it was an historic building, hundreds of years old. Bertie couldn't wait. Last year, Darren's family had been to Cannonshot Castle. It had a moat and battlements and a headless ghost in the West Tower. There was even something called a joust, where real knights in armour fought each other on horseback. Bertie thought he'd make a brilliant knight. Sir Bertie of the Green Bogey. He would rescue princesses and slay fire-breathing dragons. Miss Boot had better watch out. Bertie raced to the back seat, only to find Noel Nick and his weedy pal Trevor had got there first. They were sucking sherbet lemons. Handing out sweets was the only way. Nick could get anyone to sit next to him. Too slow, Bertie, smirked Nick. Bertie scowled and sat down next to Darren in the seats in front. Doink! Something hit Bertie on the head and bounced off. He turned around. Did you throw that? Throw what? Nick gave him a sickly smile. Bertie picked a yellow sweet off the floor. This. I don't know what you're talking about, sneered Nick. Seen anybody throwing sweets, Trevor? Er, no, Nick, said Trevor meekly. Liar, said Bertie. Frog face, replied Nick. Yeah, frog face, said Trevor. You wait, said Bertie. Bertie, I won't tell you again. Turn around. Thundered Miss Boot. But miss, it wasn't me. Sit down. And if I see you turn round again, you will sit next to me. Bertie flopped back into his seat. He didn't want to sit next to Miss Boot. He'd rather sit in a bath of cold custard. All the same, he would get even with that sneaky no or Maybe Rust Bottom Hall had a deep, dark, dungeon. 
Maybe he could lock the door and leave Nick to the rats. Chapter 2 The coach swung into the drive and came to a halt. Bertie trooped off with the rest of the class, eager to start exploring. He stared. Rustbottom Hall was a crumbly old house with a clock tower and a wonky weather vane. The roof was whitewashed with pig poo. Is this it? asked Bertie. Isn't it magnificent? said Miss Boot. This hall has been home to the Rustbottom family since the 17th century. But where's the moat? asked Bertie. There isn't a moat. And where's the drawbridge? It has a front door. But where are the knights going to do the jousting? Miss Boot gave Bertie a pained look. Rustbottom Hall is not a castle, she snapped. It's a house. A house? Bertie couldn't believe it. He'd been looking forward to seeing a real castle. Battling on the battlements, rampaging round the ramparts. What was the point of coming all this way to see a crumbly old house? If he wanted to see a house, he could have stayed at home. It's not like Cannon Shop Castle, grumbled Darren. It's falling to bits, moaned Eugene. Quiet, thundered Miss Boot. Now we will all be having a short tour of the hall. After that, we'll split into groups to do an exciting quiz. Follow me, class. They trudged inside the hall. It was cold, dark and smelt of mothballs. There were podgy little angels painted on the ceiling. Remember, warned Miss Boot, no running, no noise, and you are not to touch anything. Everything in this house is old and very valuable. Bertie plunged his hands into his pockets. This was the worst school trap ever. That had more fun last year at the sewerage farm. At least Trevor had slipped and fallen in. The tour of the house went on for ages. Twice the guide had to ask Bertie not to yawn so loudly. Afterwards, Miss Boot divided them into groups. Bertie's group had Darren and Eugene, which was good, and Sandra, which was not so good. I don't want to be with Bertie. Soaked Sandra. I want to go with Lucy. Miss Boot took no notice. She handed a worksheet to each group. It involved trailing around the hall to answer a list of questions. Bertie stared at it in horror. Thirty questions. It would take days to answer them all. He felt tired just looking at them. I don't have a pencil, he said. I told you to bring one, snapped Miss Boot. Bertie searched his pockets. I did. I must have lost it. Then share with Darren, Miss Boot glared at him. Work as a group and answer the questions. And Bertie? Yeah, miss. Do not touch anything, not even the door handles. Bertie trailed after Darren, Eugene and Sandra. Why can't I be the one to write the answers, grumbled Sandra. It's my pencil, said Darren. Can I borrow it? No. Please, no. You're mean and ugly and I hate you, said Sandra. I want to be in Lucy's group. Bertie looked over Darren's shoulder. How many have we done so far? Darren checked the sheet. None. No or Nick breezed past them. He had brought his own pen and clipboard. He was in a group with Trevor, Alice and Mia. What's the matter? S stuck already, Bertie? Cheered Nick in his reedy voice. No, said Bertie. We've answered loads. How many? Three, lied Bertie. We've done four, boasted Nick. And we've got them all right. 
I bet we get loads more right than you. Bertie watched them hurry off in search of the next answer. He hated to be beaten at anything by No or Nick. He hadn't forgotten the time Nick had taken the part he wanted in the Christmas play. If Nick's team got top marks in the quiz, he would boast about it for weeks. Well, Bernie would show that smarty pants show off. We've got to beat them, he said. We can't let them win. How? asked Darren. They've got the brain boxes in their group. They haven't got me, said Bertie. Or me, said Eugene. Or me, said Sandra. No, said Darren. Like I said, they've got all the brain boxes. How long have we got left? asked Bertie. Darren checked his watch. Um, 20, 30, not that long. We'll have to speed up, said Bertie, taking charge. If we whiz around, we can find all the answers before them. Where to next? Darren checked the sheet. The library. Chapter 3 They charged along the corridor with Bertie leading the way. How many books are there? Darren read out. Bertie looked at the shelves. Millions! Bertie, start counting then, said a snaring voice. No or Nick leaned in the doorway. We know the answer, he smirked. Want to give us, us to give you a clue? No, get lost, Bertie glared. It's so easy, said No All Nick. Easy peasy, said No All Nick. Yeah, easy peasy, said Trevor. Come on, said Nick to his team. Let's leave the dunces to work it out. Bertie's group charged upstairs and downstairs, up more stairs, along corridors, into broom cupboards. But however fast they went, Nick's group always got to the answer before them. With time running out, they found themselves on the top floor. Bertie looked at their sheet. that had left eight questions blank and Darren had doodled on two of them. Bertie didn't feel that confident about the rest of their answers either. Bertie sighed. There was no way they were going to win, but they couldn't just stand by and watch Nick come top. They had to do something. Where are we? said Eugene. Bertie read a label on the wall. The blue bedroom. And look, this is the last question. What can you, you see on the chamber pot? What's a chamber pot? asked Darren. Bertie pointed. Look, by the bed. Ha ha ha, giggled Darren. It's a potty. On a cabinet sat a pale blue potty with a Chinese pattern. Dragons, said Bertie. That's the answer. It's got dragons on it. Brilliant. Darren wrote it down in the box. Do you think we're the first ones here? Looks like it, said Eugene. Suddenly, Bertie had an idea. Why don't we hide it? What? said Eugene. The potty. The next team will never get the answer. Sandra stared. Miss Boots said we weren't to touch anything. She'll never know, said Darren. Anyway, we're not going to touch it. Bertie will. Me! Darren shrugged. It's your idea, and I'm doing all the writing. I can't do everything. I'm not touching it, said Eugene hastily. Nor me, said Sandra. Bertie hesitated. If he got caught, he'd be in major trouble. But it would be worth it to see Nick's face when he got Bertie gave the right answer. He got down on his hands and knees to crawl under the rope barrier. Hurry up, hissed Darren, before anyone comes. I'm hurrying. Bertie reached out and made a grab for the potty, knocking over a candlestick. It rolled across the cabinet and clattered onto the floor. A moment later, a much louder noise split the air. Bring! Bertie turned pale. You set off the alarm, gasped Darren. Miss Boodle, kill you, said Eugene. Told you so, 
said Sandra. Bertie was dancing around with the potty in his hands. What shall I do? he cried. I don't know, said Darren. Hide it. Bertie looked around in desperation. He could hear voices approaching, feet thundering up the stairs. Any moment now, they would burst in and he'd be caught. He did the only thing he could think of. He unzipped his jacket and stuffed the potty inside. Chapter 4 Miss Boots' gaze swept over the class like an icy wind. Some foolish person has set off the alarm, she said. I trust that none of you know anything about it. The class shook their heads. Bertie tried not to look in Miss Boots' direction. He was sweating. Could she see the big lump under his jacket? How on earth was he going to smuggle the potty back inside without getting caught? The staff are checking the house to make sure nothing's missing, said Miss Boot. So while we're waiting, let's go through the answers to the quiz. The class took out their sheets of paper. Right, said Miss Boot. Who can tell me the answer to question one? No Nick's hands shot into the air. 20 minutes later, Nick's team had scored 28 marks out of 29. Bertie's team had scored two. Number 30, last question, boomed Miss Boot. In the blue bedroom, what can you see on the chamber pot? Silence. Only one hand went up. It belonged to Bertie. Bertie, said Miss Boot, surprised. You know the answer, do you? Yes, miss. It's dragons. Dragons? Miss Boot checked her sheet. The answer I have is sea monsters. Bertie was outraged. No, dragons. I'm sorry. I have sea monsters here. But the dragons, miss. No arguing, Bertie. But, miss, they are. Miss Boot turned away. Final scores, then. This was too much. Bertie unzipped his jacket. Dragons, he said. Look, I'll show you. He held up the potty for everyone to see. Eugene covered his eyes. Miss Boot's face turned white, then purple. Bertie, she thundered. Where did you get that? Oh, um... I can explain, mumbled Bertie. Bring it here, now, ordered Miss Boot. Bertie pushed his way through the crowd. Now he was really for it. He was so busy worrying about his punishment that he didn't see No or Nick stick out a leg. Bertie tripped. The potty slipped from his grasp. Crash! There was a shocked silence. Bits of priceless potty littered the grass. Bertie looked up at Miss Boot. Oops, he said. Good job it was only an old one. Book three, Magic. Chapter one. Bertie tore off the bag and shared at the black shiny box. The Marvel magic set. Amaze your friends. A magic set, he gasped. Grant smiled. I saw it in a shop window and thought of you. Do you like it? Like it? Bertie would have happily swapped his sister for a magic set. He'd always wanted to do magic. He ripped off the lid. Inside were cards, boxes and plastic cups. Everything he needed to become a world famous magician. Bertie put on the black coat and the magician's hat. He waved his magic wand. Careful, said Gran. I don't want you turning me into a toad. Bertie stared at her. You think I'll be able to do real magic, he asked. Of course, with a bit of practice. Fantastic, said Bertie. The set came with the Marvel book of 101 magic tricks. It was a fat book with a lot of pages. 
Bertie didn't have time to read it right now. He wanted to get started on some magic straight away. Pick a card, Gran, he said, holding out a pack. Gran took a card. Don't let me see it, said Bertie. He screwed up his eyes, frowning hard. The King of Hearts, he said. Goodness, so it is, laughed Gran. Really, said Bertie, amazed. Definitely, said Gran. The King of Hearts, how on earth did you guess? I don't know, said Bertie. It must be magic. Bertie could hardly believe it. This is fantastic, he thought. All these years I had magic powers and I never knew. He rushed into the kitchen. Mum, mum, I can do magic. That's nice, said mum, sipping her coffee. No, listen, real magic. Ask me to make something disappear. Okay, how about this? Mum held up a half-eaten chocolate biscuit. Watch, said Bertie. He closed his eyes and thought magic thoughts. He waved his wand three times. When he opened his eyes, the biscuit had vanished. See, I told you, magic, he said. That's amazing, Bertie, said Mum, who seemed to have her mouth full. Bertie was on fire with excitement. He could do anything. He could turn his t teachers to stone. He could make sweets grow on trees. He could make his sister his slave. Wait till he told his friends about this. Half an hour later, Bertie was standing in Eugene's garden. What are you going to do? asked Eugene nervously. Just a magic spell, said Bertie. I've got to practice on someone. Why can't you practice on Darren? Darren shook his head. It's best to start on someone smaller. Why don't you turn him into a spider? No, cried Eugene. I don't like spiders. A worm. That'll be easy. He looks like a worm, grinned Darren. All right said Bertie. Close your eyes. Promise it won't hurt, said Eugene. Go on. Eugene reluctantly closed his eyes. Bertie covered his head with a black cloth. It's dark. I don't like it, wailed Eugene. Keep your eyes closed. That's the magic cloth, said Bertie. It's not your hanky, is it? I don't want your germs. Quiet, said Bertie. How can I do spells if you keep talking? Bernie frowned. He raised his magic wand and chanted the magic word. Stinky pinky, punky squirm. Change you, Dean, into a worm. He whipped off the magic cloth. Ah, screamed Darren. What? gasped Eugene. Just your ugly face, hooted Darren. Ha <laughs> ha. Bertie couldn't understand it. He'd waved his wand and repeated the spell. So why hadn't it worked? When it tried the magic on Mum and Gran, it had worked perfectly. You opened your eyes, he said. It's not my fault, said Eugene. You must have said it wrong. This is boring. Let's do something else, yawned Darren. It will work, said Bertie. I just need a bit more practice. Just then, Eugene's mum stuck her head out of the back door. Bertie, she called. Your mum's on the phone. Bertie sighed. He pocketed his wand and went inside. Darren watched him go. Hey, Eugene, he said. Want to play a trick on Bertie? What kind of trick? A magic trick, of course. Eugene frowned. Do I have to wear a hanky on my head? You don't have to do anything, said Darren. Listen to this. This is what you'll do. 
Chapter 2 Five minutes later, Bertie was back. He looked around in surprise. Where's Eugene? Darren didn't answer. His mouth was open in astonishment. Look, he said. What's the matter? There, look. Bertie stared. Eugene's jumper lay on the grass. Something inside it was wriggling around. They both squatted down to take a closer look. A small pink head peeped out of the collar. It was followed by a long pink body. See, gasped Darren, it worked. What? You did it. You actually turned Eugene into a worm. Bertie stared. That's Eugene? It must be. But he was here a minute ago. I know. Then there was a flash of smoke and stuff, and the next minute he'd gone. Bertie stared at the tiny wriggly worm. You're sure that's him? Of course. That's his jumper, isn't it? Wow, said Bertie. I did it. I actually did it. I told you I could do magic. The worm was wriggling its way across Eugene's jumper, trying to escape. Bertie picked it up, letting it wriggle on the palm of his hand. It was slimy and cold to the touch. Bertie could see now that it was definitely Eugene. It had the same worried expression. Careful, said Darren. Don't drop him. Bertie cupped Eugene in both hands so he couldn't escape. This was incredible. Astonishing. He, the amazing Bertie, had actually turned Eugene into a weeny, wiggling worm. If he could do this, there was no limit to his magic powers. People would pay millions just to come and watch him. No hurry, said Darren. But hadn't you better change him back? What? Change him back. You can't leave him like that. A blackbird might eat him. Bertie hadn't thought of that. Still, it shouldn't be that difficult for a master magician. If he could turn Eugene into a worm, changing him back would be a piece of cake. He sat Eugene down and covered him with the magic cloth. He raised his wand and waved it three times in the air. Biggly boggly, bogey's green, turn this worm into Eugene. Bertie whipped off the magic cloth. The worm raised its head, or maybe its bottom. It was hard to tell. Bertie twiddled his wand. Um, maybe we just need to wait a few minutes, he said. Chapter 3 The minutes ticked by. They were still staring at the worm on the grass. This is not good, said Darren. This is a disaster. This is a... Yes, okay, don't go on, snapped Bertie. He couldn't understand it. The spell had worked fine the first time, so what had gone wrong? Maybe he'd waved his wand too often or muddled the magic words. He tried the spell again. And again, nothing happened. This was terrible. He'd changed Eugene into a wriggling worm, and now he couldn't bring him back. What are we going to do? he asked. Don't ask me, said Darren. You're the magician. It'll probably wear off, said Bertie. Hopefully. Spells don't last forever, do they? What if it doesn't, said Darren. What are you going to tell Eugene's mom? She'll go potty. Shut up, said Bertie. I just need to think. He was pacing up and down the lawn. Maybe he should take Eugene home with him and consult his Marvel book of 101 magic tricks. 
Eugene, your supper's ready. Bertie froze in horror. Eugene's mum was coming down the path towards them. Quick, hide him, hissed Darren. Bertie scooped up Eugene and slipped him into his pocket. Eugene's mum stopped and gave them a puzzled look. Where's Eugene? I thought he was with you. No, said Bertie. He, um, he went in to change. Change? Yes, to change into something smaller, said Darren, grinning. Bertie gave him a sharp kick. Eugene's mum was looking at them as if they were up to something. That's odd. I didn't see him come in, she said. Didn't you? said Bertie. Maybe he just sneaked past. Yes, probably wormed his way in, said Darren. Bertie shot him a warning look. Anyway, he said, we've got to be going, haven't we, Darren? Have we? Yes, you know, my mum said I've got to go home. Um... Eugene's mum had suddenly leaped backwards, as if she had stepped in something nasty. Bertie looked down and saw the worm dangling from his pocket. He was wriggling around, trying to escape. Bertie quickly pushed him back in. There's a worm in your pocket, screeched Eugene's mum. Yes, he's my pet worm, said Bertie. He likes it there. Bertie calls him Eugene, don't you? Bertie, said Darren. Um, yes, said Bertie, turning red. Although he's not Eugene, obviously. He's just a worm. Anyway, we better be going. He backed away and fled up the garden path. Chapter 4 Back home Bertie hurried to his room and closed the door. He found his old goldfish bowl, the one that had belonged to his pet worm. Arthur, before mum threw him out and filled it with mud, leaves and a dollop of peanut butter. Peanut butter was Eugene's favourite. Bertie rushed downstairs. He found the Marvo book of 101 magic tricks in the lounge and flicked through the pages. There were card tricks, vanishing tricks, mind reading tricks, but not a single mention of worms. Bertie threw the book down in disgust. He was really starting to worry now. What if Eugene was stuck as a worm forever? How was he going to explain it to Eugene's mum? She'd probably faint from the shock. Bertie! Uh-oh, mum was calling. Bertie! she yelled. Come here this minute! Bertie trailed into the kitchen. What? Don't pretend you don't know. What have I told you about keeping pets in your room? Bertie turned pale. His mum was holding a goldfish bowl, an empty goldfish bowl. Where is he? He gasped. If you mean your revolting worm, I threw it out in the garden where it belongs. No, wailed Bertie. Dashing outside, Bertie searched the flower beds on all fours. Eugene might be anywhere now. He could have crawled under a rock or been swallowed by a crow. And it would all be Bertie's fault. Eugene would never forgive him, especially if he was already dead. Bertie scrabbled around in the dirt. Out of the corner of his eye, he caught sight of something. Eugene! Bertie had never been so relieved in his life. But wait a moment. There was more than one worm. There were three. Three fat pink worms. Which was Eugene? Eugene, said Bertie, speak to me. Wiggle your head if it's you. The worms all wriggled, but not in a way that helped. It was no good. He would just have to keep all three until he could work out which one was Eugene. 
But where could he hide them? Not in his bedroom. Mum was bound to find them. It had to be somewhere. She would never think to look. Bertie smiled to himself. He knew just the place. Ding dong! Bertie thumped downstairs and opened the door. Darren stood outside, grinning like mad. Hi, Bertie. Where's Eugene? he asked. Shh! hissed Bertie. Not so loud. He's safe upstairs. Really? said Darren. Are you sure? Of course I'm sure, said Bertie. Are you sure? You're sure? What is this? What's so funny? asked Bertie. Surprise! Suddenly, somebody leaped out from behind the door. It was Eugene. He looked pretty calm for someone who'd recently been wiggling around in a flower bed. Bertie stared at him in astonishment. But, but, ha <laughs> ha! Your face! <laughs> Eugene and Darren were laughing so much they could hardly speak. But how? stammered Bertie. You're a worm. I hit you upstairs. Darren wiped his eyes. Don't be stupid, he said. We played a trick on you. A trick? It was Darren's idea, explained Eugene. We found a worm. And put it in my jumper. I was hiding in the bushes, watching the whole time. And you believed it, giggled Darren. You actually believed it. I didn't really, said Bertie. You did, hooted Darren. You were in such a panic. Bertie laughed. He had to admit it had been a clever trick. Ah! A deafening scream came from upstairs. What was that? asked Eugene. That, said Bertie. That sounds like my sister. I think she might have found something in her drawer. Bertie! Come on, said Bertie. I think it's time for a real magic troop. The one where I disappear. <laughs>